Hello and welcome to this podcast, which is part of a series called Inventing Embodiment. My name is Jonathan Burrows. I'm a choreographer and also a faculty member at the Centre for Dance Research at Coventry University. Last year, my colleagues at CDARE met online once a week to talk, and the conversation kept coming back to the question of how we speak about embodiment. This podcast aims to capture some of the research I was fortunate to hear then. My guest this morning is Susanna Fulmer, who is a dance scholar at CDARE. Welcome, Suzanne. Hello. Can you start by telling us a little bit about what you're researching at the moment? Yeah, so what I'm researching at the moment actually doesn't have to do all too much with the body. (laughs) So I may rather talk about what I, I did in terms of research when I was working on this topic. And that was mainly when I was doing my PhD thesis 15 years ago. (laughs) And I was highly interested in the question of what a body does on stage in contemporary dance. And I observed a lot of also due to the work I did at that time as a production assistant, assistant to artistic direction of a large dance festival in Berlin. Um, I was observing a lot of contemporary dancers such as Max Stewart, Savé Leroy, also later dancers from Brazil like Wagner Schwarz, um, who actually were dealing with this question of how much can you extend your body? So what if the body doesn't end at the limit of your skin? And what about all these concepts of the body? And I was interested in the idea of an unfinished body in terms of bodies as a material on stage that you can use, that you can try to deconstruct, that you can try to transform. And I think the, in the meantime, very famous example is Savé Leroy's performance, Self Unfinished, where he morphs through different states of a human body, a body that looks a bit amorphous, perhaps like an insect or like an amphibic animal. Um, and on the other hand, of course, also it was about the question, to what extent can we deconstruct certain conceptions of the body? So that means for me, the body is, of course, always already culturally constructed. So, of course, there is a certain idea of body as a biological matter. But in the moment where we talk about the body, the body in dance, we always already talk about certain conceptions of the body, culturally also naturally conceptualized bodies, be it the the highly trained body in dance or the so-called free body in dance, such as Isadora Duncan. But then again, there are certain concepts behind it, of course. So in what way is the body used as a material on stage, a material that you can work with, that you can knead through? But on the other hand, also what kinds of conceptions exist of the body in dance. Virtuosity, for instance, is a big topic that you can deconstruct on stage, that you can dismantle. So that was what I was interested in. And of course, it's still with me, but it's not in the main, it's not the main focus of my research at the moment. But from what I understand, you've been looking at this idea of choreography as a form of protest. Mm -hmm. And surely there's an element of embodiment involved in that. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for pointing this out. Choreography as a medium of protest is just briefly, I'm looking at it from two sides. So for instance, you can use choreography as a tool in order to arrange your protest. So flash mobs would be an example. So the way you choreograph a protest. And on the other hand, you can use choreography as a lens to look at protests, at any protests, rallies, marches, and the way the bodies are gathering in space, the way they relate to each other, also in terms of internal hierarchies, for instance, internal power relations in a protest, for instance, people standing and and listening to a person on a stage, which is a bit more on an upper level and talking down to people. But then also, of course, um, relations between protesters and organs of the state, such as police and so on. And the body is of interest here because, well, I have to go back a bit. Uh, So actually, I was interested in choreography as a medium of protests, also in the realm of all this social media protesting that came up, especially during the Arab Spring 10 years ago. And there was this saying that, yeah, there is social media, which is why revolution was possible. 
And we all know, okay, it supported certain riots and certain upheavals, but it's not that revolution was only possible because of Facebook or so. So um, then, but then what was interesting is that, of course, you can't only protest on social media. It's still the body and the bare body that is on the street, that is a critical mass. And without bodies on the street, I think protests wouldn't have that much of an impact. And one of the important aspects here is the very vulnerability of the body, being on the street, putting yourself into danger, protesting. And Judith Butler, for instance, says that this mode of vulnerability is actually the very prerequisite for mobilizing people going to the street and thereby vulnerability is a certain agency of people going to the streets and claiming certain issues um, standing there literally um, in order to claim certain rights and so on and therefore it's very important to still have bodies gathering in masses on the streets which of course these days where we're in in a moment of a pandemic isn't either possible or it is not that easy anymore. So you have to find other modes how you can gather bodies on the streets, for instance, with keeping your physical distance and so on, which also is lends this whole idea of the vulnerability of the body another perspective. <laughs> yeah. Um, are there any questions or doubts or concerns mm. that you have about the way that the idea embodiment is used in dance practice or in dance scholarship? Ooh, that's a big question. <laughs> I don't have, well, for a starters, I wouldn't have general doubts. I sometimes come across readings where I have the impression that there is the caveat that you take the body as a given in terms of, oh, there's the body, that's a given. Um, it's sort of a, a more essentialistic view. And because there is a body, we do this and that. Yeah. And I think it's very important to be always aware that the body is a cultural concept. So it's, there is no such thing as Gerald Sigmund, a colleague of mine and a dance scholar says, there is no such thing as the body. Yeah. You don't have a body because a body is always already configured in a certain sense. For instance, in dance, it depends on which kind of dance technique you've been growing up with, to put it in quotation marks. Um, it's also a lot about what do we think about the body when we think about a dancing body? Is it an able body, a highly trained body? Is it a disabled body? So um, there are so many different remits that the body touches upon. And and I'm getting cautious, let's put it that way, if I have the impression if this isn't taken into consideration in dance scholarship, if it's just about, okay, there's the body and it's all nature and let's connect. And we have a direct relation to each other because we are the bodies. And I think, no, no, that's actually not the case. <laughs> How do you think we negotiate that going forward? Um, you mean for discussions in the future? Yeah. Yeah. And, and in practice and scholarship. I think it depends whom you're talking to and how elaborate a discourse can be. Because, for instance, if we talk amongst dance scholars and dance practitioners, I think we are always already on another level where we can critique embodiment, where we unfold this whole variety of embodiment, because like, for instance, for many participants in this conversation in dance practice and in dance scholarship, the idea that, for instance, the, the body is a thinking body is a given. So yes. that embodiment is a kind of can be a kind of reflective practice as much as thinking with your brain, yes. That's to, to put it very simple. But then, of course, if we go into disciplinary and depending where we go, be it the humanities or neuroscience or um, sociology, we have to start from a totally different place, actually yeah. making sure in the first place that it's not, there's no such thing as the body hanging as a loose baggy container below the brain. Yes. <laughs> but there's actually also a certain discourse that the body elaborates, although it may not be a verbal spoken discourse. I just had this discussion with a colleague a couple of years ago. She was from film studies and she was really very assured that there is no such discourse in dance, in, in, in the body. And I thought like, uh, no, <laughs> 
it's such it may not be the spoken word but of course also dancing is a discursive activity because there is no such thing as uh, the dancing it's always already as i said conceptualized it has different if we want to go there different languages sometimes it doesn't have one but it it it's it's part of of a reflective system let's put it that way and so it would really depend um whom i'm talking to and i think in the interdisciplinary realm there's still a lot of work to do <laughs> when it comes to um, promoting embodiment as a way to reflect certain issues, certain topics, with this, on which has the same legitimacy as thinking and talking about something. Um, that feels like a good place to pause. Thank you yeah. so much, Suzanne, for sharing those thoughts with us today. Yeah, thank, thank you. Yes. Happy, happy to do so. You're welcome. <laughs>